Well, let's get right to it. I love God's Word and just unpacking it. Um, it just, I, I don't know why uh, I think sometimes that my words are better, you know? God's Word is so good. And sometimes we deceive ourselves and think, you know, I could say this pretty good. And then you get in Scripture and it just speaks to, it, to the heart. It cuts to the heart. It's alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And as we think about this topic, addiction-proof parenting, what I want you to see, so I'm going to look at the, what I call the five mentalities of a drug addict, the mind of an addict, versus the mind of Christ. So I want to compare and contrast those, and then I want to do a little twist on it and put it in the context of parenting and grandparenting, all right? So how are we raising our kids, our children, to think? Are we raising them to think like drug-addicted people, or are we raising them to think like the mind, of, to have the mind of Christ? So that's the uh, goal in this workshop. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 16 is up, but I'm actually going to start in verse 11. So if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 2, 11. And we'll read through verse 16. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So imagine an eight-year-old child. Eight-year-old young child who says this, Mommy, I'm sad. Can I go play a video game? Mommy, I'm sad. Can I play a video game? Well, what's going on here? I mean, the kid's not doing heroin. That's good. Not doing cocaine. But I think there's an underlying thought here of, and we just looked at it in Proverbs 23, of I'm sad, where do I find something to fix that sadness? How do I medicate that? How do I alleviate that out of my life? And I've got an idea, mommy. It's a video game. I know that works. Well, they're not, again, using hardcore drugs at age eight. But we don't want this mindset to foster, to be fostered and to develop. So what's the heart be, be, desire behind this question? That's always what I'm talking about and looking at in like the Understanding Temptation booklet that I wrote and the, the talk yesterday, the dynamics of temptation. What are the heart desires? And I believe there's three, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, that really drive motivation. But I want to explore the five mentalities of an addict and the five marks of a transforming Christian. And I say marks because none of us have arrived. None of us are perfect, right? But there are marks. There are things that we can identify, that we can see. It's just like when a kid grows up and you mark the, the wall. Age five, you're this tall. And every year we mark that wall. Well, these are marks of a transforming Christian. So you'll see these things in people's lives as they are transforming. And I don't love the word recovery. I know it's a word that the addiction world uses. You know, it, it means to recover your old self. 
well, I don't want to be the old Mark. I want to be like Christ. I want to be transformed from caterpillar into butterfly, something completely different. And that's a better word, I think, is transformation rather than recovery. So I get these five mentalities out of two places in Scripture. So let's look at the first one, uh, the first passage. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So that's our first mentality. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so what I did is I said, okay, loving God with everything that's in me, heart, soul, mind, that's the first commandment. Well, what's the opposite of that? And that's this first one, first mentality of an entitlement mentality. Now, it's ownership, but it's really more than ownership. <clears throat> An entitled person believes it belongs to me and I deserve this. You owe this to me. I'm entitled to this. And that's often a theme when I'm working with drug addicted people. They, they tend to have ownership. I appreciate Jack, Dr. Street last night saying the only thing we really own and deserve is death an everlasting death in hell. That's what we deserve. I mean, that's a stark reality, but that's the truth of, of where we are. We, that's what we deserve. So anything better than that is just cupcakes and icing, right? It's icing on the cupcake. And so the drug addict thinks, I deserve this, it belongs to me. Rather than worshiping and loving God and serving Him, they're thinking about everything on the earth belongs to me. I'm a little G God and you all exist to please and to serve me. And so there's pride of living to please self, not God. 2 Timothy 3, verse two through five, verses 2 through 5, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, so there's, there's one thing we see. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. The tricky part about working with the addicted is you can't enter into their addiction and their pig pen, you know, their, their mess. Uh, you have to call them to repent and love them. But that doesn't mean turn your back on them, not pray for them, not try to reach and help them. So that, that's... You know, when it says turn away from such, it means in fellowship, in, in partaking of uh, intimate fellowship. And so this entitlement mentality is what you see. The heart, soul, mind is all focused on serving self, and it's idolatry at its core. Exodus 20, verse 3, everybody knows this one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what's going on here is another God, the God of self. That's what it is with, with addicts. I don't think about it as all these other different little gods. They're using tools to create the God that they want to be, their best version of themselves. And so they are living in such a way that they are God in place of God. And Ezekiel 14, 11, 1 through 11 is there. We won't read that whole passage. I, I really like that. I do a teaching on that. Um, it's just the audacity of these leaders in Israel coming to God and saying, we know better than you. We know what we need. We know we're going to tell you what to do, God. And, um, and he deals with them in a very stern way, as he should. And parents foster this mentality by saying to their kids, Follow your heart, sweetie. Sweetie, 
you just do what you do. You just follow your heart. You just go there. Where do you want to go eat? What do you want to wear? And they, and I say that in that voice, but they're allowing their kids to be the boss applesauce, to feel entitled, to say, yeah, I get to decide where our family goes to eat dinner. And, and I'm not saying that that's wrong occasionally, that you can, can't do that for fun, but you see parents, especially if you go out in public, continuing to give kids too much authority too soon, and the kids run the house, not, not the parents. And in the book, The Heart of Anger, Lou Priolo, who was one of my mentors, I'll never forget, early on in the book, there's a page, a picture there of a little kid in the middle, and everybody, everything around him, is they're trying to please this kid, and he's running the house, and Lou says, that's why he's angry. Well, you think about it, if you're in charge, and you're not really able to be in charge, but they put you in charge, and you're telling everybody what to do, and they're not doing what you, do, what you want, and you're immature, you're going to be angry and frustrated. So you want to make kids angry, put them in charge. Let them rule the roost. They can't handle it, and it will frustrate them and anger them. <clears throat> and so parents today have, have fallen into it. I have too, of um, letting your kids decide. You decide. You follow your heart. You do what you feel is right. But the mark of a transforming addict is opposite that, and that's in our verse in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38, to be humble, be humble, to say things like, everything I have belongs to God. God owns everything, I own nothing. I'm just simply a steward. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which we, ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So I have to get to the place where I say, God, you own everything. I own nothing. And so with kids, you know, Christmas presents. We used to tell our kids, I mean, <laughs> they have more bad stories than good stories probably with their parents. When you write a parenting book, you just need to put the subtitle, what Mark and Mary Shaw did wrong and what God says to do right. You know, that, that's the deal. But I remember with our kids, you know, one year getting that loud um, Sesame Street, Elmo, was it Elmo or Cookie Monster? He was playing drums. And I don't know why my parents wanted to torture. We didn't live together back then, so that's probably why. But you get this loud toy and there's your little one, they're excited about it, and you have to say, now this toy belongs to mommy and daddy. And you ask permission to use it, and then we'll, we'll let you, because you can't let the kid run around with that toy all the time, especially if you work out of your home or you're, you, know, you need some quiet, peace and quiet here and there. And so we, we kind of emphasize that with our kids, that you know, these are gifts, yes, to you, but mom and dad, are the owners, you're a steward of this toy. You still have to ask permission. You have to take great care. Just because you're a steward doesn't mean you can use it, destroy it, do whatever with it. And so learning to, to teach our kids that uh, they need to think as stewards, not as owners. 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So faithfulness is the key virtue we can teach with stewardship. And it's true of all of our gifts, right? All of you in here have spiritual gifts. You have abilities. God's given you that. And you're to steward that well, well whether it's uh, in music or in the arts or in, 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 in drama and in teaching and in, in preaching, counseling, whatever it may be, whatever the gift, and there's so many more. You're to use that gift not as an owner. You look at secular artists. They're making a big to-do uh, about uh, the, the guy, um, Elton John. You know, great gifts, but treats those gifts as though he's the owner, denying the God in heaven that gave him those gifts. And so he's really a steward. He should use his gifts for the glory of God. And there are others. I just picked him. 
But the heart, soul, and mind are all focused on serving and loving God, just as our verse, verses tell us. And so we don't want to give away decision-making power too early. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And just like Eli's sons, we don't want to abdicate our authority as parents and give our kids too much power. If you look at 1 Samuel 2, 17, 12 through 17, the sons of Eli, they knew not the Lord, but they were put in a position of authority and power, and they abused it. Well, they didn't know God, first of all. Second of all, they were immature and, and wicked in how they used their authority. And so as parents, we have to learn that lesson. Eli is not a good example in the Bible of good parenting. Um, that's not what we know him from in his, in his best pursuits. So let's look at the second mentality. It's a consumer mentality. Verses 39 to 40 talk about serving other people. Now notice in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, it never says, love yourself. It says, love God, love other people. The love of self is not in there. Now, there are addiction programs that teach, and they believe because you don't love yourself, well, I'll just say it, celebrate recovery. They teach because you don't love yourself enough that that's why you do drugs. Well, I would say that's, that's so wrong, and, and some of the things Celebrate Recovery does are okay, but some of the things they teach are unbiblical and lead people away from Christ, and so they, they teach, you got to love yourself before you can love God and love others. Well, that's really not what the Bible says. The Bible says love of self is a problem. We love ourselves too much. We have to learn to love God, walk in the Spirit, not to um, gratify the desires of our flesh, love God, and love other people. So this consumer mentality is all about a temporal mindset, comfort at all costs. I will not share. I'm not going to go without. A consumer, if you go to a, uh, a Costco or a Sam's Club and you walk in and you're a consumer, a customer, you're there to buy items to consume, and somebody runs up to you with a mop and a bucket and says, hey, spill on aisle five, clean it up. Well, wait a minute, whoa, 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 I'm a consumer here, right? I'm a customer. That's not what customers do. We don't clean up the spill on aisle five. But now if you flip it and you have a stake in that company, you own that particular store or part of it, you work there, then that is appropriate because you're a steward or a part owner or whatever in, in that organization. But as a customer, as a consumer, you know, we're really not there to serve other people. We're there to take, consume it means you use it all up. And that's what you see with an addicted person. They use up all of their resources on what? On me, on self, on the God of self. Now in counseling, you know, I, I, I get there, but I don't oft automatically start with the language I'm telling you. You understand that. They don't understand God of self. So I talk to them about self, self, but then eventually take them to God of self and idolatry and help them to see that it's a sin issue in their heart. Well, parents can foster this by saying things, you know, if it breaks, I'll get you a new one right away. They want to alleviate all pain in any way possible. I never want my kiddo to have any bad experiences. Let's, let's pray this morning. Lord, wrap us in bubble wrap. Let us not stub our toe. Let us not get hurt. Let no bad thing happen. I mean, we, we can pray for that, and we drove here, so we pray for traveling mercies. We're not praying for a car accident or anything like that. It's fine to do that, but I think sometimes we go a little too far, and we don't embrace suffering. God uses suffering for our good, for our character. And, and we can embrace that. So rather than, you know, I had a man uh, two nights ago, he, he wrote a great book. His name is Jay Younce. It's called Everyday Talk. I love that book. And he told me, he said, you know, his wife got cancer and she said, well, this is what the Lord wanted. You know, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to face it and, and 
face the challenge of it. Not that I like it, but this wasn't outside of his power realm. Oops, uh uh-oh, I let Ruth Younce get cancer. What was I thinking? I mean, she's like, no, God has allowed this, and I'm going to face it for the glory of God. And uh, she did did that and did a, a great job with that. And in Jay's book, just to, to encourage you to get it, he's got one everyday talk and then one uh, on sex, which is excellent as well. But Jay, he talks about how parents, th- this one man wants to go golfing. So he's got his tea time, he's all set, he wakes up and he looks out the window and his child is there, young child, and he looks out and guess what? It's weather like today, it's raining. And you know what he says? He says two words, but they're powerful. Stupid rain. That's what he says. Stupid rain. Well, you know, it it seems like two little innocent words, right? But what message is he sending this kid? When he does devotionals and says, God's over our rain. God, you know, we don't believe in Mother Nature. We believe in, in God, the Father, the Creator. He sends the rain. Well, Daddy, you said stupid rain the other day when you wanted to go golfing. And so the messages we send our kids as parents, we have to be very careful about the words we choose and the messages we're sending to them. And one of them, I think, unfortunately, is we don't want our kids to suffer any consequence or any pain. So parents will have a goal to never allow pain or negative consequences. If the kid does something wrong, or gets his homework, gets a bad grade, they're calling the teacher. He forgot his homework, I swear it was right there on the counter, and, and he had it, he did it. We trying to rescue them out of consequences or not allowing them to experience the hardship of that. And, um, and, and kids pick up on that, people pick up on that. And so we want to make sure we are not encouraging a no pain at all costs kind of mentality. In Matthew 16, 22 through 23, Peter took Jesus and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Be, but he turned, but Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Well, in our culture today of men, it's all about trauma. That, that's the big trend right now, is every addiction comes from trauma. There has to be trauma in their lives, and there could be. Like we just looked at in Proverbs 23, could be. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes people are just seeking pleasure, or they're trying to escape from pain, in the way that they want to escape to their broken cistern. But Peter had the worldly mindset here and a satanic mindset. And God, God wanted him to think, Jesus wanted him to think like God, to have a heavenly perspective. So parents foster this by saying things, you know, if it breaks, I'll get you a new one right away. Encouraging an escape to pleasure for temporal things. Psalm 55, 6 says, And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. There's a desire in us, and even in this psalmist, to want to escape, to get away, to be at rest, to find peace. And then finding fulfillment from this world to be used by me, for me. Colossians 3, 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. (coughs) Excuse me could turn away, couldn't I? So the mark of a transforming addict is this, to be giving. We want to teach them not to be consumers, but to be givers. And stewardship is tied to this, right? If I'm a steward, I can give. But when I'm an owner, when that's my money, that's my money, honey. You're not getting a cent of it. Well, the entitlement mentality and the consumer mentality go together. But in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, the, the, the principle here is to say, I love God. He owns everything. I'm going to be humble in, in that. 
and then I'm going to give. I'm going to share with others. I love Ephesians 4. It says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. So he's got to work, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. So you labor and give. And I think the principle is the same here. Teach our kids to labor with their own hands and to be givers. To share with people in need. Find people in need to bless, to help, to share with. And that's really the essence of being Christ-like because Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his, ransom, give his life as a ransom for many. I love Acts 20, 35. I've showed you all things. How that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to receive. Is that what he said? Nope, just make sure you're awake. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's the mind of Christ. That's what we're trying to instill in our kids. Well, when I meet with drug addicts, what do they do? They're entitled they're consumers, it's all about me, they're idolaters, so you need to serve me because after all, I'm a little G God. I deserve you to serve me and I deserve you to give to me what I want. And that's the way they think and live. Even though they wouldn't say it that way, they're too smart to say it that way. That's how they're thinking and that's how they're living. It, it's, it's represented by their choices by their outward manifestations, that's where you see it. You don't often see it. They know the right words to tell you. I mean, I'm telling you, I sit down with drug addicts all the time. They know, I got one guy, I mean, he just always gives me the right answers. And I always say to him, now that's the right answer, now tell me what you really, what you really mean. I say that to him 10 times every time we meet. Now that's the right answer, but tell me how you really feel. Tell me what you're really thinking about. What's your real thoughts on that? That's the right answer, but I don't believe that you believe that. Now, I have some time with this guy, so I'm not trying to pretend like I can read his thoughts. But every time I've done that, he said, okay, well, here it is. He just knows the textbook answers. He knows how to manipulate people and how to tell them what he thinks they want to hear. And he's great at it. I mean, great. I wish you were here now. You could just see us interact. It, it, would be, it would be spectacular. You'd probably think less of me. This guy, this guy will make you look silly. He's so good with people. And I have to bring his wife in to meet with him just because he's so hard to counsel. I need that secondary source of truth to say, is that true that what he did? No, that's not really how it happened. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, let's talk about what really happened. It's just a life of deception, and it's motivated by fear. So those are our first two mentalities. Let's look at the, the third and fourth and fifth, and they're found in Ephesians chapter 5. So turn your Bibles there. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess or is a debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So out of that verse, I, I will unpack this more and explain it, but the victim mentality versus the, the mark of a transforming addict is to be responsible or be obedient. And we'll look at that more in just a minute. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing in melody in, the, in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a perishing mentality versus being grateful. And then the third part, the third one comes from the final verse, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, a rebellious mentality versus being submissive. So let me unpack those three now. The victim mentality is this in verse 18. It's not a true victim, but it's someone who wants to be treated like a victim. So there are true victims. There are sufferers. We get that. But this is someone who wants to act like they are a victim when they are actually making choices that they're responsible for. Does that make sense? So I want to be careful with that because I want to make sure 
everyone knows if you have a true victim, you want to treat them with compassion, enter into their suffering, help them. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about here, and I'll, I'll explain it more in a minute. They say things like, it's not my fault, I've been wrong, I was dealt a bad hand, my life is a mess because others have messed it up, it's my DNA, my grandfather drank, so I drink. Uh, it's, it's just all kinds of excuses that take the responsibility off of me and place it where? Really on you. I mean, if you think about a victim when you're working with somebody, and, and we're not talking about a real victim, a, someone who wants to be treated like a victim, if they're successful in doing that and pushing it off of themselves, they're pushing it back on you and everybody else. So guess who, who, has, who has a need for the gospel? It's you. You need the gospel. I'm a victim. I need to be comforted. I need to be encouraged. I need to be helped. I'm not a sinner, so I don't need Christ for my sin problem because I don't have one. You're the problem. My parents are the problem. My environment is the problem. The problem is outside of me. That's why I don't like the disease concept. My problem is out here. It's not my fault. And so what it does is it does violence to the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. People don't need the gospel when they're victims. It's not their fault. I mean, I hope you don't encourage your counselees to confess um, things that aren't their fault. If they're sufferers, we want to we comfort them. We want to help them to trust in Christ more. We want them to see God's loving, redemptive plan in their lives. We want them to see that and to know God for who he is. But if they're a sinner, but they're trying to blame shift and move it off of their plate onto other people, then we have to help them to see you're responsible. You made choices. You did this. And so the, there's an excuse for bad behavior. Why should I love other people when I'm hurting so badly? An excuse for lacking love. Why should I care about anyone? No one cares about me. These are kind of the statements you hear in the addiction world. And they enjoy the attention and sympathy of other people. I mean, that's what they are living for. Luke 15, 29 in the prodigal son parable but this is the older one. He, he answered his father in Luke 15, 29, answered his father and said, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid or young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Victim mentality. I've not done anything wrong. I'm blameless here. The blame needs to be shifted to you. And in this case, in the prodigal son, to you, Father. You're the problem. You haven't even given me a small goat so that I can have a little party with my friends and yet you're killing the fattened calf for this brother of yours who squandered everything on prostitutes. You're celebrating him. You don't celebrate me. And so the victim mentality, I think, is alive and well in that older brother in that parable. Parents foster this attitude. They don't do it on purpose. It's unwittingly. But they'll say things like, you've had such a hard life. If you're a sinning family member, if your father or your mother, it's usually on the other side of the family, right? If that person on the other side of your family, not my side, but that side, wouldn't have hurt you, then your life wouldn't have been so hard. You didn't have a chance. I mean, I had a mom who lost her daughter because she was involved in prostitution and drug dealing. And the Child Protective Services came in and took this child out of the home. And when she was in recovery and getting sober, she said to her daughter, we don't know why God did this, why God would take you out of our home, but he must have a plan. 
Well, you know what? We do know why God took her out of the home, to protect her from you, you monster. I didn't say that. But that was the, that's the, the mind of someone who's not yet transforming and not really repentant is this mother who's saying this to a child because a child's going to get more angry at God. What this is, is this is the mind of a victim who's blaming God. We don't know why God did this. He did it. He's sovereign, but he's not good. He didn't have a good plan. And now you're out of our home. You're in foster care or wherever she was. She should have said, a repentant person says, Honey, I don't like it, but I was in sin. The choices I made. She doesn't have to describe all the details of that to a little child. The choices I was making were wrong, and they were putting you in danger. And these authorities came in to protect you from that. And I'm so glad they did, even though I don't like the situation. But mommy's repentant. Mommy's going to be making right choices. But she wasn't there. So guess what I knew about her? She, she's not going to be clean and sober the next time I hear about her. And she wasn't. I don't know if she ever cleaned up. And this wasn't somebody I was really counseling. It was more of a situation I just was consulting or helping with. But that's the kind of language parents use when they themselves are victims and then they're instilling that mindset in their kiddos. But the mark of a transforming addict is to be responsible. This person says, it is my fault. I will repent. And they learn to take on biblical responsibilities and not to take on other people's responsibilities. Well, I have reference for you, uh, Mark 7 and 1 Samuel 13. You can look those up because they're really good in, in illustrating some of this. But in a personal example, there was a young man I counseled who was worn out. And so as you're asking questions and getting to know him, he's worn out. He has a wife and, and a couple of little ones, really young children. But his sister's husband was doing crystal meth, living out in a tent, out in the middle of a, of a forest or somewhere, not living for Christ, on crystal meth, involved in, in all kinds of, of wicked stuff. And this guy took on the responsibilities of that man who abdicated his responsibilities and tried to be the husband and father of for her and her three kids. Now, not in a weird sort of way, but in a role sort of way. He took on the role of husband and father to these three kids in this family because it was his sister. And in one sense, that's great, right? He's, he's entering in, he's trying to help, he's doing all he can. Well, his sister loved it because she needed help, especially with three young children. But the problem is he wasn't designed to be a husband times two or a father times five. God had only given him the responsibilities of one wife, two children. Now, he was supposed to be the best brother to his sister and uncle to his three nieces and nephews or nieces. But he, um, though that was so understanding his role, what were his responsibilities biblically? What were his responsibilities? What, what were not his responsibilities biblically? And so helping people to sort through that is very important, especially with a guy like this who's starting to think like a victim, like, well, I can't take on all this. I can't do this. Why is God doing this to me? I can't, I can't handle all of this responsibility. Well, the answer was God didn't give you all this responsibility. You took on some extra things. And then now you're failing really in, uh, in your own home. And so we have to help people with this because they get to where they feel like the learned helpless uh, principle in psychology that idea of the uh, rat in the box who just sits there and gives up and dies and won't hit the lever because every time they hit the lever before, they got shocked and they just quit. Well, people get to where they just quit and give up. <clears throat> and that's the, the mind of a victim, but um, mindset, the mentality of a victim, 
what we want to help them to be is responsible. Take on your responsibilities and be obedient to those. Now the fourth mentality, the perishing mentality is self-pity. It's a woe is me, why me? Bad things always happen to me. Now I don't know how many of you are Winnie the Pooh fans. How many are, can appreciate Winnie the Pooh? There's a, a happy person, there we go, good. That's Ed? Come on now, you guys, there we go. Thank you, I see that hand, yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's a little joke for my charismatic friends. Um, <laughs> I have to be careful. Remember, where am I, where am I speaking again? Um, <laughs> um, Eeyore. Winnie the Pooh. This is Eeyore. The perishing mentality. Bad things always happen to me. There is a great little YouTube video. It's like three minutes long on Eeyore's depression or the depression of Eeyore. Something like that. And if you can watch that, I mean, every time somebody gives Eeyore a compliment, he turns it into a negative. It's so funny. They said, oh, we like your new tail, Eeyore. It's not much of a tail for not much of a donkey. I mean, just robs the joy right out of the compliment, right? And he does that over and over and over. Well, that's who I think of with the perishing mentality. But the reason I looked this up in my Bible, it's actually in Proverbs 31. And this might not be in your notes. <clears throat> Proverbs 31 verses 4 through 7 says this, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong wine. Now I'm just going to let that sit there, kings and leaders and princes. Verse 5, here's why. Lest they drink and forget the law. Well, we know when you drink, you kind of get a little more loosey-goosey you're willing to try different things. I mean, they talk about it as a gateway drug, just like marijuana. It affects you and it loosens up your, your ability to keep the law. And I remember counseling young ladies who were on psychotropic drugs for their anxiety and the psych psychotropic drugs lowered their inhibitions and some of these girls ended up doing things with boys that they shouldn't have done and they would not have done had they not been on the drugs, but they're still responsible for the choices they make, but the drugs lower their inhibition. So please understand, I'm not uh, letting them off the hook. And the same for guys. When you drink a little bit, you get a little bit sassy and bold and wild and all that. And so lest they drink, verse 5, and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So they're they're not only going to forget the law, but they're going to take advantage of the afflicted. People who are already hurting, they're going to figure out a way to take advantage of them. It sounds a lot like idolatry in how they're viewing people as objects. And then verse 6, give strong drink. Well, wait a minute. Give strong drink? Give strong drink. Well, what, what is this about? Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. So what I believe that is, is it's like hospice care today. Somebody who's dying, they're on their deathbed, maybe cancer or whatever ailment, they're on the way out, you give them a strong drink. And here's why, as the verse continues, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts, let him drink and forget his poverty. Just like the rulers forgot the law, he forgets his impoverished state. He forgets that he's dying. It relieves his suffering. It's, it's a gracious thing at the end of life. And remembers his misery no more. So there is a purpose for drugs and alcohol. <clears throat> a good purpose. A medicinal purpose. And, and Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for what ails your stomach. So the Bible doesn't say, oh, never, never, never drink, never do anything. It's saying... This is the time to do that, to relieve suffering. Well, the perishing mentality person, the Eeyore walking around, they think they're dying on their deathbed of cancer. They're unhappy when they get a million dollars because now they got to pay taxes. They're unhappy in every way. So guess what they think? They think, well, this verse must apply to me. 
Give strong drink to the one that's ready to perish. Well, I'm ready to perish. And wine unto those with heavy hearts. I got a heavy heart. But I believe that verse is really talking about physical pain, suffering, anguish, and oftentimes at the end of one's life. So the perishing mentality, that's where I came up with this word, is right out of there. And they will call themselves haters of self and say things like, I hate myself. I mean, that's what they say. But I remember Dr. Street teaching years ago, and I told him this. Uh, He was teaching. He said he was counseling a young lady, and and they left uh, the office, and he saw her in the cafeteria, and all through the session was talking about how she hated herself. I just hate myself, I hate myself, I hate myself, I hate myself. And he goes and he's watching her go through the salad line and she's picking out the best lettuce, picking out a tomato, oh, I don't like that one, putting it back, putting the best tomatoes, the best eggs, the best cheese, the best olives. She's picking out the best. Well, wait a minute. An hour ago, you said you hated yourself. Now, through the salad line, you're picking all the best things. Is that consistent with how someone who says they hate themselves? Is that consistent way of acting? Doesn't match your words that you just said. And I'll never forget that. I I mentioned that to him uh, yesterday. Because Ephesians 5.29 says, For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. And so people really do love themselves, even though they say they hate themselves. You can think about yourself so much in such a negative way and think that that's hatred, but what it's really doing is putting all your energy and focus on self. Self's the object there, not Christ, not um, other people but you're focusing in on yourself in a negative way. Now, people do it in a prideful way, right? We call that boasting and pride. Well, focusing in on yourself in a negative way of self-pity, that's self-pity, and self-pity is pride in reverse. It's, it's the same as pride in a positive way. It's just all directed in a negative way. And people can become suicidal, despairing, I'm doomed, why should I live? In 1 Kings 19.4, you, you know this, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. And we know he needed sleep and food to eat. He needed some physical things tended to. But who is this? Elijah. Very good. Give her a gold star, whoever's tracking those. Um, Very good. Elijah. What had just happened? What did Elijah do? Yeah. How many people were... He chopped people up. I mean, I know this is a PG-rated, you know, message. That's a little gory. But he was exhausted. And can you imagine how hard that would be? Even though these are people who deserve it, you know, in, in God's eye and you're doing the command. But this is, this is um, you talk about trauma. That's what he experienced. And so he's like, you know what? <clears throat> I'm out. I'm done. Take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. I don't want this anymore. It's too hard to serve you, God. I quit. Whatever you want to call that. But that's the place he was. And I really appreciate the Bible being honest. And showing us that because there are dark days. There are hard days for all of us in ministry. But that's this perishing mentality and understandably so with Elijah. I'm not giving him an excuse. It's not right. He needed and, and the angel had him sleep and then made food for him to eat. So took care of some physical things that were going on too. He was exhausted. And so people quit and give up. There's nothing I can do to to change, what's the use? You know, that, that end of what we read in Proverbs 23, verse 35. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. I'm going to drink again. It's God's fault 
and he's going to have to fix it. That's kind of the mentality here. They wouldn't say it in that way, but that's what they're saying in their words and actions. And people foster it, parents foster it by saying, you have it harder than others. You're not as blessed as other people. You're stupid. I mean, I hear that kind of thing in the counseling office quite often of just wicked parenting burdening these poor people that I, I am, am privileged to meet with. But the mark of a transforming addict is to be grateful. I will thank and praise God even for the trials in my life. You know, I don't know if any of us like red lights, do we? Is there anybody in here who loves a red light? Just, I cannot wait. I mean, when I'm praying, I'm like, when I'm driving, I'm praying, God, be like Moses and just part these red lights and uh, part this and create a, a green light, red sea for me, a green sea, you know, just, just open it up. Uh, move all this traffic over and let's let me barrel on through, right? But I really think baby believers become mature believers when they start to understand suffering and they thank and praise God even for the trials in their lives. I mean, look at our, our text again. This is verse 19 of Ephesians 5. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in, the, in your heart to the Lord. So in your heart, you're praising God. So what's going to flow out of your lips? Praise for God. What you're filling your heart up with, it's just like if I fill this up with gasoline, what should I expect to pour out? Gasoline, right? If gasoline's in it, if I'm filling up my heart with the praises of God, I can expect to bless God with my lips. And so we're teaching them to thank and praise God. Look at the rest of this verse, verse, or verse 20. Giving thanks always. Always. So that's even in the bad times, right? That's good and bad. Giving thanks always always for all things good and bad unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ learning to say Lord thank you for the red light I like uh, football and uh, we grew up in in Alabama and I know you are Clemson and uh, Gamecock fans here but um, and I'm not really an Alabama fan but you know, I like to say I am just so you can be on the winning team, but they're not doing so well lately. So, um, but I talk about football. I heard um, an interview one time. It was just it was just amazing. In college football, this is in the uh, I believe in the '90s. Jay Barker was a quarterback for Alabama, and they were playing Florida. And the quarterback for Florida was Danny Werfel. Both guys are professing Christians. Now, whether they are or not, you know, I don't know. You can Google it. I don't know. But they both profess to be Christians. I know Danny Werfel has a ministry down in New Orleans. Uh, and Danny Werfel for Florida, when he would throw a touchdown pass, he'd get down on his knees and he'd do like this over his head. I'm not going to get on my knees because Dr. Ken would have to come pick me up, help me get up. But he would get down on his knees and do like that. Danny Werfel did. So a reporter, being kind of snarky, asked Jay Barker, the Alabama quarterback, he said, Jay, you're a Christian, right? Danny's a Christian, right? How come when Danny throws a touchdown pass, he gets down on his knees to thank God, but you don't do that? Now, this is obviously not a believer <coughs> trap question, and I love Jay Barker's response. Jay said, well... The Bible teaches me, and I believe it's this verse and in, in verses, well, these verses in 19 and 20, to give thanks always for all things to God. So that means if it, I threw an interception, I'd have to get down on my knees and do this. And if I did that, my coach would yank me out of the game, Gene Stallings, and put me on the bench and I'd never play again. Well, that was a good answer. We need to be mature enough to thank God for the interceptions in our lives as well as the touchdowns. And I think that's where the, the rubber meets the road when you're counseling a drug addict. You're helping them to learn to deal with sorrows, disappointments, sufferings, which are really 
sad and hard, but you have to teach a biblical view of suffering and learning that self-pity is just pride in reverse. Now, our final mentality is this, the rebellious mentality in verse 21 of Ephesians 5, <clears throat> which says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so biblically, this is a fool. If you look in Proverbs, you see a fool. The fool says, I'm my own boss. I answer to no one. And they say things like, I don't have to do what you say. I mean, Psalm 10, 4 says, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. And Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. <clears throat> so they say in their heart, their deepest desire, there's no God. There's no authority. No one I have to answer to. I'm God. I'm little g God. And they'll say things, the kid will say things like, you're a hypocrite, so I can do what I want. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Proverbs 12, 15. And they'll say things like, I don't care what other people think. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it my way. Frank Sinatra, right? Proverbs 10, 8. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. So that's this rebellious mentality. And parents accidentally, unwittingly, or purposely foster it by saying, you can't count on anyone but yourself. Take care of number one. You've got to look out for yourself. Don't trust authorities. Don't listen to what your teacher says. She doesn't understand you or like you. And, and maybe not in so um, blunt, such blunt terminology, but these are messages that parents send in subtle ways to their kids about authority. And you think about in the home, between the way the husband models love in the home and the way the wife models love and respect in the home, and the, does the husband respect his wife? Does she respect her husband? Do they love each other well? All of that is important for kids to see godliness. That, that's what I appreciate about certain Christian movies that are made. They're not all perfect. I don't agree with all the theology in some of the movies, but I appreciate godliness being demonstrated, prayer being demonstrated, like in that War Room movie. I mean, I didn't agree with everything in that movie, but at least it demonstrated a heart and, and how people pray and how they're relying on God and how they're treating each other, et cetera, et cetera. And so there were some good visual lessons as so I appreciate about Bob Jones and the, and the arts and the things that you guys do here um, uh, to portray godliness and, and to do things in a godly way. So the mark of a transforming addict is not to be rebellious, but to be submissive. And I picked the word be on these rather than a mentality because, again, they're marks of transformation. But Romans 12, 1 and 2 it says to be conformed to his image. We'll, we'll read that in a minute. But the word be is in that. And so we're human beings, not human doings. Be submissive. Learn how to be submissive. I serve the king of kings. God, this human authority is placed there by you. I will obey his word. And submission always has a human face. Romans 13, 5 through 9 teaches us about being subject to our authorities. And so I may not like the authorities God's placed in my life, but I can't say, well, I'm going to disrespect you, Mr. Authority, because I don't like you. No, I have to learn to submit and salute, even if I don't like the person, I'm saluting the position See an authority as good and from God. <clears throat> Colossians 3.22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, not, not as a fake, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And then even harsh authorities. Now that's hard. Now we're not talking about people that are asking you sin. You're never to do that. But even people that you think are harsh to you, and again, not sinning against you, not abusing you, we're not talking about that, 
but you just think, man, that was unfair. That wasn't right. That was harsh. Learn to submit to them. 1 Peter 2.18 is powerful. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward, uh, the unjust, the difficult to deal with, the controlling person. And so these are the five mentalities that I hear with drug addicts and the five marks of a transforming addict. And I think parents can do a lot to instill right, Christ-like, biblical thinking in their children. And grandparents can do the same, right? Grandparents don't have to be Disney grandparents who give their grandkids everything they want. They can help instruct them. What's great about our family dynamic, my mom and dad are believers, live with us, and um, my dad is a great influence on my kids. You know, he's an evangelist. He goes after you, and he confronts you. He's been texting me about the coronavirus, you know. <laughs> I, I laugh. He really has. He's all, uh, you know, concerned about that. But when he's concerned about something, he goes after it. And so I'm like, Dad, we need to trust God in this. You know, we need to trust God. But with the kids, when he hears stuff, he confronts them. And he's grandpa, so they listen to him more than they listen to me, right? Which is nice. And they know grandpa loves them and he'll do anything for them, but he's also going to call them on the carpet in a godly way, in a good way. And so grandparents can do this as well. Let's end with these two passages, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, which is glorious. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. And then Romans 12, 2, I alluded to earlier, and be not conformed. This is a being, not a doing. Be not conformed to this world. Don't don't allow yourself to just get conformed, pressed like a cookie cutter into the world system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does transformation take place? Renewing your mind, which means tearing down the lies that I believe in my flesh and putting in beliefs from the principles and truths from God's word. I have to believe truth and doubt my lies that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen?